So, May 1st, 2019, Keeping the American Dream Alive. We opened our panel with one of the pillars of the American Dream on public health and medical research with Francis Collins, the director of the largest medical research institution in the world, the NIH, Sue Desmond Hellman, CEO of the largest foundation, the Gates Foundation in the world, Bernard Tyson, whose Kaiser facilities uh, serve communities that hold one-fifth of the U.S. population, and Seema Verma, as the head of CMS, really running the largest company in the world, uh, covering $1.3 trillion a year in medical expenses. Yesterday, you heard many panels on other pillars, the free enterprise system, entrepreneurs. And so today, we are really focused in education. Today, we are focused, Robert, three of us have lived our own American dream. Robert his, Ray his. I've lived my own American dream. We've had the good fortune of having good teachers, good families, friends, colleagues to help us along the way. So I'd like to start, Ray, when the way you think and talk about these issues reflects to me somewhat like an engineer looking at a complex machine and tinkering with what works and what doesn't work. How do you see the American dream? Well, I guess the first question is, can we agree what the American dream is? Um, do we agree that it is aspiring for equal opportunity? Uh, if, and then we look at it, is it producing, is the system producing the output that we want? We'll get into this, um, but I, there, you know, I could rattle off statistics in which uh, I looked at the bottom 60% of the population. I um, picked the bottom 60% because it's the majority of the people. The per capita income hasn't risen. The 40% uh, of the population, according to a Fed study, uh, can't raise $400 in the event of an emergency. Uh, the majority of people, unlike in the past, believe that they're um, unable to have uh, their children and unable to have a rising living standard. Uh, we're in the bottom 15% of educational standards in the developed world in terms of testing. I mean, we can rattle those things up. The top one-tenth of 1% 1 of the population's net worth is equal to the bottom 90% combined. Is it a... Is the, um, top 40% spend five times as much money on their children's education than the, those in the bottom 60%. There were just so many statistics that means that there's not an equal opportunity. And it, it starts with equal education. So the things that you mentioned, the things that I was blessed to have, which is I'm, I'm, I was blessed to have parents who cared for me. I was at their adequate nutrition. You know, 17.5% of the population of children are in poverty and are, are in families that have food malnutrition. 17.5% of the population has that. So I had adequate nutrition, and I was able to go to a public school that provided me with a good education. Well, let's, let's take a look at a video. Ray, I had the honor of being able to interview you not too long ago when your book came out. And you kind of set this stage that you're talking about is what it was like growing up in your family. Let's take a look at that for a moment. Ultra rich in being able to have two parents who loved me and to be able to go to a school in which I was well educated and to have um, then an environment which was also inspirational in that um, it, it was an aspirational environment. It was the time when, you know, John Kennedy was going to go to the moon and we were going to eliminate poverty, and the United States was the richest country in the world with um, counting for 40% of world GDP, and that whole aspirational opportunity, you know, the idea of equal opportunity and a great abundance of it in the, in our parents, where you would do better than your parents, it was a different kind of environment then. So it's, it's very mechanistic to me. 
Can we agree that that's not the way it is anymore? Can we agree on those changes? Can we agree that we need to do something to improve it? Every system needs to be renovated, needs to be improved. Can we agree that we need to do that? And I think if we don't agree, we'll have some form of, of revolution um, that can be uh, to abandon capitalism or to go to an opposite extreme. And, uh, and I think so, I study history, long-term economic history. And when I look at that history, it's clear that if you have a population where there's a large wealth uh, gap and you have an economic downturn, almost reliably there is conflict that's dangerous. So I think that's the picture. So let's follow up on a couple of things you said. Uh, Credit Suisse puts out a report on wealth patterns across the world every year. And what's very interesting if you look at this, I think it underlines the point you're making, Ray, but if you look at this chart, you see that the U.S. and Australia have the highest percentage of their populations that are millionaires, around 6.4%. And if you look at average net worth, uh, you will see the U.S. ranks pretty high on average net worth among all countries, developed countries, uh, greatly due to this uh, income dispersion that you spoke about. But we rank second to Australia. The thing that is interesting, when you look at, at median net worth, you start to see that the U.S. alongside Greece in the developed countries has the lowest median net worth. And I think the point you were driving home is if we look at the percentage of the population that has a net worth under 10,000, you can see here that the U.S. has the highest percentage of these various developed countries with a net worth under 10,000. And I think that's setting the stage for the question you're putting forth. Robert, I'd yep. like to go to you. Mm -hmm. One of the things I heard and read uh, was about your grandfather, but before we go there, you have given some of the most inspirational commencement addresses ever. So we have a short clip of one you gave out in Denver not too long ago that really kind of talks about the American dream and then we can think about your environment growing up. Sure. Let's see what you said. And in my community, my neighbors were mostly educated, very proud, hardworking, and ambitious. They were dentists, music teachers, politicians, Pullman porters, teachers, contractors, pharmacists. And they were focused on serving the African-American community and providing a safe and nurturing environment for the kids of our neighborhood. They'd been on the front lines of the Civil Rights Movement. They sacrificed their sons to the Vietnam War. They mourned the death of a Kennedy, of a King, and then another Kennedy. And they had not yet achieved the fullness of the American dream for themselves. But they believed it was only a matter of time. And if not for them, then surely for their children. They believed that our imperfect nation was becoming more perfect every day. And they believed that by conducting themselves and raising their families with integrity, they were contributing to that process of perfection in a very real way. So Robert, let's talk about your family and let's talk about that message that right. you're delivering to those students. I'll tell you, and I agree with Ray, and I'm gonna to get to this in a second, about it's time to re-architect what is this American fabric that creates the American dream? You know, when I was growing up, Denver, Colorado, I was born in 1962. If you think about it, out of the nine Robert, generations... Robert is just a baby. He's a kid. Yeah. <laughs> how, do, think about how do we even invite him to the panel? <laughs> if you think about it, of the nine generations of my family that has been in this country, you know, the, the first six and a half plus generations were enslaved people. I'm the first of, that gener of my line to actually have full rights in this country. Think about that. Voting rights, 
the opportunity to go to a good public school, the opportunity to live anywhere I want. If you put that in context, what happened as I grew up is my family, I had a nurturing set of parents, I had a nurturing community. We wanted the same things as everyone else, safe streets, good schools, an opportunity to raise a family and children without the threat of justice being misapplied. And that was taught every day. And so we saw the optimism of America in the 60s and in the 70s, and I was the first group well, of going to desegregated schools. I was bused across town with, and it's kind of interesting, we were all on this one bus, bus number 13. Now, what's so interesting, I know almost 80% of the people who were on that bus for the six or seven years that, that busing actually was enacted. We have elevated that entire group. There's only one of those folks who was on that bus who actually got incarcerated. We have doctors, we have lawyers, we have politicians, we have investors, all because we had the opportunity to get into a great public school. Then I went to a great public high school. My parents were both teachers. Not only did they teach us, but they taught everyone in the community. And a number of my friends became teachers, got PhDs, because they saw my parents. And they said, that's a profession that I want to be a part of. That dynamic lived in my neighborhood. It doesn't live in that neighborhood as much as it today, as much as, as it did then. The economic opportunity that was afforded me, I think, has changed. It has shrunk. And in some cases, we're now fully realizing a lot of the policies that were built in this country from Reconstruction to the New Deal to, you know, what we had to deal with the GI Bill and its disenfranchisement of African Americans. We had a period of time, a window opened. Through the luck of life, I happen to be one of those kids who made it through that window. Because when I look back at these schools now, they are as segregated as they were in the 50s. The communities are as segregated as they were in the 50s. And that, I think, is going to be the challenge, because when you look at the data, the bottom two-fifths, three-fifths, you have 37-plus million African Americans who have one-tenth the wealth of the rest of America. And if we don't change that, I think we're going to have an issue, especially as we have more and more people who get subjected to systemic underdevelopment, economic underdevelopment, and underpreparation to participate in this economy. So I like this the idea of driving shared prosperity. I love the idea of re-architecting what, what, what the American dream's mechanism is. And I think that's part of what we can do here together, public-private partnerships, working with the government, working with individuals and companies to make that happen. So, Robert, I think um, you definitely touched on one of the keys uh, to our future center for the American dream, and that is education. So, Ray, I do a lot of reading. Uh, when you say something, your books, and you, one of the things that struck me is you talk about self-reinforcing spirals up and for the haves and down for the have-nots. What creates these spirals, and how can we address them? What I, what I was describing is there's a mechanism. So if we agree that the polarity is developing, there's a mechanistic reason. And I don't think it's because bad people are doing bad things and everybody's trying to blame each other. There's just mechanism. And what we have <clears throat> is a um, wonderful profit-producing system in which um, profit reflects that your revenue, which means the value of what you're producing, is greater than the cost, which means the resources that you're putting into it, and it's an effective resource allocation system. And in that system, there's, um, over a period of time, there have been developments in pursuit of that profit, which have resulted in technologies developing, so that it's cost-effective for companies to replace people and change 
um, how they're working and, and, and what the economics, which is hollowing out the middle class. It's profitable and efficient for companies to um, go internationally to find the best ways of producing things and the best resources in this equal opportunity world. That, um, so we see that within countries, we've had a widening of the wealth gap, but between countries, we've had a narrowing of the wealth gap as that happens. And then it's, it becomes self-reinforcing uh, on the top because as you, and then the third element I should say, is we have a monetary policy which when we had 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis um, and you hit zero interest rates, it requires the central bank to print money and buy financial assets and the purchase of financial assets causes those financial assets to go up. It was a good move, it brought liquidity to the system but it benefits those who have financial assets relative to those who don't have financial assets. So there are mechanistic reasons that that wealth gap happened. By the way, this is very similar to the late 30s. It's if you were to pick an analogous period, 1929 to 1932, same thing happened. Zero interest rates, print money. Right. The wealth gap is the same. The populism that is developing is the same. You have to go back to the 30s because that wealth gap together produces that populism and that produces the polarity and then it has its consequences. So there's a mechanistic reason for that that's self-reinforcing because then um, let's take education. I'll take a minute on education. Education is a national, it, it um, is not a national issue in that our constitution makes it a state issue. And because it's a state issue, and within a state, within most states, it's primarily a tax district issue. And so if you're lucky enough to grow up in a well-off tax district, you probably have a good public school. Mm -hmm. And if you're not lucky enough to grow up in that, you are starved for education. So now when you lose the middle class, you are losing education. You're losing those equal opportunities in that way, and they're starved, and there's no way to get around it. I could describe, literally, in education, there are um, school, schools that have to share pencils, that they literally, students will either share a pencil or break it in half and sharpen it from both ends. There's no excuse for that, but there's systematic problems. So it's a mechanistic issue, right? right. So in one way or another, if we can think is this a problem? And then just calm down and not be angry with each other. Right. And think in an engineering sense, how do we engineer it in a bipartisan way to bring people together of opposing points of view? And you bring them together who are bipartisan and skilled. Mm -hmm. And we sit down and almost lock them in a room or lock them in a someplace for enough time and make them not come out till they agree on what to do with it, we'd be a lot better off because it's an engineering exercise. Right. We so let me, I, Ray, just let me follow up on a couple of points that you've made if I could. One, you talked about people with financial assets benefiting tremendously over the last decade. It was interesting if you went back to the 60s, for example, you found individuals invested in the stock market heavily. And one of the concerns we were expressing here over a period of time, probably beginning in 05, was the government's focus on getting you to buy house as the American dream. And if we looked at how people defined it today, young people don't see the house as the American dream. And so the overinvestment in residential real estate which we had a person win a Nobel Prize telling us that if you had owned real residential real estate for 120 years, adjusted for inflation, you have a zero rate of return. If you had invested in the stock market over 120 years, you have a thousand times your money. So I think one of the points I would make is the shifting of individuals into a house they probably couldn't afford made them house poor, and as a result, from that standpoint, they weren't invested in financial instruments instead. So, 
but history. Number two, you brought up another point, and that is education. And we sometimes forget in America that America, after the Civil War, and in many ways, you could look at analogies, Robert, I wanted you to touch on these. Mm -hmm. After the Civil War, you had a country divided trying to bring it together. And America was really the first country that said, we're going to educate all the people, the poorest, the richest. And this was really not a theory before. And between the years of 1870 and 1960, the U.S. added one year of formal schooling per decade. And by 1960, the U.S. was the most educated country in the world by two years. So I think the points you were making, we can see what caused the American dream that Robert grew up, you grew up, I grew up in, was really underlined by this educational opportunity uh, focused but also people who were actually more invested in equities than real estate. Things change. And, and one of the things we've done is this is not an American dream. It became called that, but it's a dream, as Maya Angelou told you, of the world. And President Kagame was here, pointed out that this American dream is a dream around the world. We must create an economic opportunity, something that you talked about, right? and build a culture of entrepreneurism, and people take responsibility for improving all their lives. Now, one of the most powerful plays ever written was The Death of a Salesman. Mm -hmm. And I want to go to you, Robert, and what did he say? Will you let me go for Christ's sake? Will you take that phony dream and burn it before something happens? Mm -hmm. So, Robert, I want to go to you from yeah. another standpoint. Please feel free to comment. I want to ask you the question. You are, in your firm, uh, with your partner, Brian, the leading software private equity firm the world's ever created. Mm -hmm. How much is technology playing in this concern? We see this relationship between education and opportunity, mm -hmm. skilled jobs. How much is technology yeah. played if, in this? If I can, Mike, I'm going to hit a couple of the points you just mentioned and get to that one because it, it, it's important to address. When I think about this whole dynamic of wealth and wealth in America and wealth creation and, you know, the, the primary wealth of America really being land, right, that ultimately led to certain type of real estate and that development. You know, we, we, we the U.S. government gave away, in essence, to one and a half million families, 270 million acres or so through the Homestead Act and the Southern Homestead Act and those sort of things. There are only about four or 5,000 African Americans who actually got any land in that whole dynamic that occurred post-Reconstruction. I'm third generation in my family to actually own property. Now, the houses may not be worth much, but when you think about the ability to take those houses and turn them into financial assets that could then support an educational dream of one of the children in the family, it makes a huge difference. On my father's side, I'm fourth generation to go to college. On my mother's side, third generation to go to college because we were able to pool resources to get people like me and my family to go to college. It is all interconnected. And the policies that kept an economic uh, underdevelopment of a class of citizens in America is something that has to be addressed because it is what gives people like me the opportunity to go to the schools now and then become an engineer. And by becoming a chemical engineer, I learned about this world of enterprise software. And from that said, you know, if you actually take an engineering approach to managing a set of assets being companies, find great people and partners to work with, design a system that no one else has had in the past, you have the ability to get a predictable outcome. I look at where we are in America, and it is really just an outcome of a bunch of policies that we've had basically since Reconstruction that have not been unwound properly. And so they will continue to systemically depress a class of citizens and classes of citizens. And that's how you get the spiraling up. I remember the first time I became a capitalist. I was cutting lawns, you know, you know shoveling. So I had $1,000 to 
1978. I actually went to World Bank to deposit that money, and they said, you can buy a CD and get 10%. Now, I'm not arguing we need to have those sort of interest rates. But I said, wow, if I deposit this money, I can actually make $1,100, $100 in profit. And, you know, it was about a year. And so I did that. And then I did it again. And I learned, wow, that's a whole lot easier than cutting grass. <laughs> uh, let me, let me right? ask you one question, Robert. Um, your income was a level that you didn't learn about taxes. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Right? Thank goodness at that time. So the dynamic of, 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 of what entrepreneurism, becoming a capitalist, having access to educational funds, having a community that valued educators, that valued education, and, and then ultimately gave me a chance to see this moon landing, work at a place like Bell Laboratories, and say, wow, technology is the future. And if we orient it properly, we can create massive amounts of wealth. Not just for me, my partners in our firm, but for whole communities. I always talk about this is the first time really in the history of the planet that you can actually create wealth just by what you know, accessing computing power. Computing power is now $30 a month or free depending upon where you access it. Whereas when I was coming up, it was $1,000 an hour and it was controlled by the government, large corporations and universities. Today, you have the ability to go to any library and access more computing power than we had to launch the Apollo missions. That dynamic is something we have to drive our citizenry towards, all of our citizenry towards that, because that's what's gonna keep America and make that economic reality again and that American dream of home ownership, economic prosperity, ability to, frankly, you know, raise your children a reality again. If we don't do that, I actually think it's gonna, it's gonna stifle a larger and larger class of citizens that will say, no mass, no mass, we're not gonna do this anymore. And that's gonna change all of our lives dramatically. So, technology has played a role, but the underpinning of this is education. At the end of the day. Right. To participate. Ray, I know your family's been very active in education in these issues here. Um, talk to us about, do you see a, a strategy? In other words, if we're gonna adjust this, uh, if we provided no, we eliminated student loans and found a solution to that problem, would that change the dynamics in your opinion? What are some of, let's talk about your tinkering with the system as an engineer. Okay, where should we go? Where should we be focused today? Focus us in a direction. I think we could look at it at from the top down, top up, from the top down, or from the bottom up. I, th I want to start with the top down, because we each have our PAC approaches, and each one has what they would do. And I worry that the arguments of those things can stand in the way of us actually making progress. Mm -hmm. So it's called the narcissism of small differences. When you're so number one, can we agree that we got a problem and that we have to? have a renovation and make some changes, number one. Number two, I believe that you're not going to make any changes if the people on their, on their, who have their hands on the levers of power don't make changes. That may be, whether it's at a national level or at a state level, it's up to those people to make those changes. It's gotta be top down. Now, number two, it must be bipartisan. If it's not bipartisan, we're going to kill each other. Um, then, when we get into the particulars, yes, there are things I see, but I want to also emphasize that the education that I get is so much from people who also get to see it up close and different, and the variety is enormous. When I think of Jeffrey Canada and Harlem Children's Zone, or I think of Mohammed Yunus and microfinance mm -hmm. and all, there's a lot of learning. So you got to bring in a lot of people who are skilled and live in those worlds and know it well, not just my pet peeves. Now, the things that I see, like you see, through philanthropy and whatever, are particular. I do like 
the idea of public-private partnerships, because the issue is, first, can we be in this together, and then secondly, in a private-public partnership, on terms of achieving those goals, you could be in a position where you have the vetting of it. You know, when, when you have a private sector who's going to invest in a deal, um, putting money in, uh, that will vet that deal, and, and I worry about government wastefully dealing with money. So how can we together do, do put more resources and work together? Like I think philanthropic government private partner. I'm doing one with the state of Connecticut. Right. So I've got an executive, a governor in the state of Connecticut, and I cut a deal, we're cutting a deal, in which we put in a certain amount of money, $100 million, they put in $100 million, and then um, others will put in $100 million. So for every dollar I put in, I get three in terms of impact. And we're brought, brought in, bringing people together. They, they feel it's a together. We got to keep it together. And we create an organization represented by all the constituents who are knowledgeable and then create a governance. So that's something I like, but it's only the thing I like. There are so many different things. You see a bunch, others. So skillful people who care about the issue working together to come up with a plan, okay? I almost don't care about the plan other than it will increase the size of the pie and divide it well. It, 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 as long as it works and it has that, then we're going to move forward. I don't believe that we're, we've defined it as a problem. You know, I'm just curious, if, raise your hands. Do you think, it's, that, do you think that, the Amer um, that capitalism uh, needs to be reformed because it's producing outcomes that are not, it, raise your hand. Okay, raise your hand if you don't. Oh, okay, well, um, anyway, it's, so I think we, I think most of them th right. see it's a problem. Okay, great, can we work together? So it's those things that I think are essential because I read history, hundreds of years economic history. And the one lesson that we have is if you have economic polarity, we have a certain, if you have economic polarity, and you have a downturn in the economy, you're likely to have a conflict. And we have a specially difficult situation because we don't have a monetary policy now that's going to be as effective. Mm -hmm. Because with zero interest rates and quantitative easing not as effective, you can have a downturn. What will the next downturn look like? If this is good, right. this is the best of times and we're at each other's throats. What is it going to be when we have a downturn? So let's take a look at this. Um, mm -hmm. Both of you have been two of the most successful investors in the world. Your investors with you are pension plans, foundations, endowments, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, family offices, and you've been generating a rate of return significant, which is why your organizations are so successful. If we go to Japan, and we see that $17 trillion is invested at minus. Mm -hmm. Obviously, no matter how much money they have, no matter what their financial assets are, they're going to be less the next year than they were the year before, and so on and so on. And so in many ways, it's the rate of return uh, that you're looking at. I'd like to come back to something that we all focused on in school, Robert, and go to you. And that's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. So when you look at that triangle that we looked at in high school or college at the time, we started at the bottom with focuses and needs for a family. And what, did I have food on the table? Did I have shelter? Mm -hmm. Then the question is, do I live in a safe environment? So before I start thinking about love and belonging and esteem and self-actualization, I think what we heard from the two of you is that you're live at the bottom of that triangle, loving parents, interested in education, providing a nurturing safety environment mm -hmm. allowed you to figure out where you're going to go. Robert, let's talk about actions maybe instead of words. You have a very diversified portfolio. Right. 
you have companies that are companies of the 21st century focused on software that theoretically anyone could interact with anywhere in the world. Young people want to work for companies that are socially responsible. Take a look through your varied portfolio, maybe give us one or two examples here of how you believe you're solving this issue, sure. okay, of bringing services or whatever they might be to people at lower and lower costs. Yeah. You know, the, the dynamic that, you know, my partner Brian and I and our partners have thought about is if you think about where enterprise software is, is going is what's going to drive that next generation of opportunity? Not surprisingly, data fundamentally is, is the construct on which the next generation of opportunity is now going to be, be, be developed on, you know, using machine learning, artificial intelligence, et cetera. And certain of our businesses capture massive amounts of data uh, for various communities, um, uh, NGOs, et cetera. And one of our companies, Social Solutions, uh, for example, has case data on students and how they're progressing. And so we built, in essence, we call it the brain, but a system that analyzes how children are matriculating through school. You can actually look at what is their, their you know, absentee rate, what is actually happening in, the, in terms of their nutrition. And from that, you can actually create intervention mechanisms and make a holistic approach to actually engage with parents, and it may be a single parent, and engaging with the school so you can make the intervention so you can keep them on track. It became so attractive, quite frankly, as a system. We had actually Steve Ballmer and his foundation invest in the company saying, you all have the most comprehensive data that actually is actionable. So when we think about it, it's not just the data, but how do you make it actionable, not only to sell more software, but to actually change holistically the lives of the groups that we, we call them. There's about 43,000 or so NPOs, nonprofit organizations, who have communities of, of people that they serve, that this system can enhance that relationship. You know, I look at that as being, that's the right sort of public, private, and now philanthropic partnership that can actually change the instance uh, of, of individual lives and communities leveraging technology and leveraging data. We, we put that, I call it, at the center of the innovation you know, dynamic in our companies, you know, between that companies and companies like Granicus and, you know, and Central Square and those, what we're really looking to do is create holistic solutions based on fact and data and tune the mechanisms as we move forward. One of the others that I think is one of the most important, you know, one of my greatest experiences in life was when I got an internship at Bell Laboratories. Internships for young students. I got it as a high school student, but internships, actually it creates a massive awareness of opportunity for people who've never seen it before on the one hand, and for employees or employers a chance to you know, kind of look at students in a short period of time and decide if, they're, if they will fit into the culture of that firm. So we built a thing called an InternX platform. We funded it, and what it actually is is think about a matching system. We do a personal readiness system for the, for the intern, and then on the company, a readiness system for the company. Do you, here's what you have, to, you have to do to be a good mentor. Here's how you do the check-in process, et cetera. And the whole plan is ultimately to create a system for STEM, and then ultimately kind of STEAM students, to now be able to apply and do a, a systemic matching so that we have more students have greater opportunity to gain, gain exposure to capitalism, to gain exposure to companies and jobs who otherwise haven't seen it. I had the great advantage in some respects living in a neighborhood where I had people who came from diverse and different backgrounds of, of, of uh, employment backgrounds. That doesn't exist as much in those communities. And so how do kids and young students get an understand what does an engineer do? What does an investor do? What's the difference between a hedge fund investor and a private equity? They don't necessarily see that, but these internship programs are a way to get a window into it. So those are the ways that we are investing time, energy, effort, money, and organizational capacity into individual companies. And if we don't have companies that do it, we go fund it ourselves. And I think that is the dynamic that keeps me optimistic about the people I get to work with and keeping the American dream alive and actually make sure that it becomes more fruitful for more people. So, Ray, let me play the devil's advocate for a moment. When we survey and look at what young people think, if you pull it up, in the United States, only 26% at the moment of people under 30 
think their life's going to be better than their parents. Only 26%. And if you go to Europe or other places around the world, you find Spain and France today have the lowest return, lowest projections at 16%, and there's a lot going on uh, in Spain today and in France from that standpoint. If you go to Eastern Europe and, and, and since, and other places in the world, in China today, 78% of the young people think their lives going to better. And even in Russia, it's 41%. So a lot of times, it's where you're looking from. And what strikes me is if you go to Vietnam or you go to Mexico and see how they feel today, 94.7% of the teenagers in Mexico are optimistic about their future today. 73% of young women believe future living conditions are getting better. And so, and in Vietnam, probably more than any countries, they believe in the market-based system. So my devil's advocate question is, is it really capitalism that needs to be changed? The rest of the world comes to America to be financed. If I'm a small business in China, I got a much better chance to be financed in the United States than I do in China today. So we are the envy of the world, our system. Our system, however, is rewarding people who have skills. So if we look at the 50s and 60s versus today, only 20% of the jobs in the 50s and 60s required a skill. Today, they require different skills. So my question is, do we need to challenge capitalism, the market, to deal with the inputs of getting people prepared so that they can take the benefits of society rather than the system itself? Well, <clears throat> um, I go, go to most of those countries and um, I've got exposure to most of those countries and I think the main thing that um, they've uh, done is it's, it's, those are realistic assessments and um, most of those countries have gone to market-oriented um, capitalist systems, but as I say, um, the world has changed where wealth gaps within countries have increased and wealth gaps between countries have narrowed. So if you're in those countries and you've gone to a market-oriented system, like China, they love a market-oriented system. There's an energy that's level. And in terms of the finances, I don't think we should be so smug. <clears throat> if you look at the debts that the country that we have accumulated, we've accumulated a lot of foreign debt. And when China... Uh, early on what, what, would lend to the United States when it had a per capita income that was 1 40th that in the United States and they're lending to the United States in something's odd there right the so you have to you have to have uh, they've benefited from the market oriented system mm -hmm. right the world has gone that idea of ca communism as we've had it in the past is abandoned and so we have a market-oriented system. But we have a situation here. <clears throat> we talk, you talked about markets and the, uh, the nature of the beast. We have a situation where um, if you're at the top, if, if you're a market investor, you're a market investor, there is an enormous amount of money. We're flooded with money. We have, we're competing with you know, how do you invest because there's too much money chasing so many assets and it's really tough. But that's clogged at the top. Mm -hmm. So now you ask my job. <clears throat> my job is to deal with those investors. My job is to, um, as you say, pension funds. They're quite often uh, teachers and uh, anyway, pension funds, endowments, foundations, some wealth funds. They're flush with money. If you got money, you can get money, you can borrow money. We're all flush with money. And then, if you don't have it, which is the majority of people, you don't have any. You can't get it, you, and because you can't get it, because you're broke, you can't borrow, and that's having a negative effect on the economy, because think about it. You put more money out and, and through quantitative easing and more money there, the marginal, you're going to a saver, 
And that saver is going to take the money that comes in, the $15 trillion of uh, QE that we've produced, and what are they going to do? They're going to put it into another saving vehicle because they're going to save. That's what they do. You have enough money, you're going to save. Now, you don't have that at the bottom. So because of that, when you got no money, when 40% of Americans can't raise $400 in the event of an emergency, right. they're cut off from the credit system. So it hurts the economy, too. If you want to stimulate the economy, you have to be in a, um, stimulate justifiably, productively, put money in the hands of those who have a greater marginal propensity to spend. And that is on productive things. I think one of the big problems that we have is we look at budget accounting rather than return on investment. Right. For example, we'll say, mm -hmm. am I meeting a budget? Mm -hmm. And a budget means revenue and outcome. And we lose the return on investment that comes from things like education. Now, you look at the cost. I go to, uh, I'm in Connecticut. Connecticut is, um, I think it's the highest per capita income. It's certainly one of the highest, one of the top three. Within Connecticut, there's a big difference between wealth and, um, and incomes. 22% of the students, the high school students, are disconnect, disengaged or disconnected. What that means is a disconnected student is a student that they doesn't come to high school anymore. Mm -hmm. They don't know where they are. Right. Disengaged student is a student who comes irregularly and doesn't participate and is at risk of dropping out. That's one in five students right. is going to go nowhere. They're going to be on the streets. If you look at the all-in cost of incarceration, the United States has an incarceration rate which is five times the average of other countries. So you raise those students and if you look at the marginal difference, if you get that student through high school and you get them a job, which is relatively low cost, and you look at that against the cost for the society of incarceration, incarceration costs on average eighty dollars to $120,000 a year. It's an enormous cost that we're paying. Right. We have to look at the all-in cost and stop and look at the return on investment of education. And, right. and those things. We don't have, and systematically, we got to do that. Right. So, Ray, let me just go to Robert. And I, I want to try to see if I can find and paraphrase a commonality of interest. If we provided education free, and that capital was provided by foundations, by and for-profit businesses, whatever it might be. And you speak about mentors. Mm -hmm. So if I have an investment in you, and Prof Professor Fuchs at Stanford said, you can identify at about a 67% probability who's going to be successful at five. Mm -hmm. So now individuals, I pick up a young Robert Smith. I tell you, you know, Robert, I'm going to cover your schools, public, private, whatever you need, internships, your college, your graduate schools, and I'm going to share with you. You're going to get, say, the first 100,000, and we're going to have, maybe I'll get 20%, you'll keep 80 above. But I'm going to try, I'm now highly motivated to make sure you're going to be successful. I'm going to go search for my student if he's not showing up in Connecticut and find it where it is, because I've just invested in that individual. And so, when we talk about assets, we have to remember that human capital, the productivity of individuals, according to Gary Becker, it's two-thirds to 80% of all the assets. It's not financial. When you're hiring a person, if I told you that person was worth five million, I doubt if that means anything to you, you want to know what is their productivity, exactly. what are their skills. So I, both of you have spoken about education. And so it seems to me if this investment that you're telling the country to make, Ray, look at it, education as investment, not as expenditure. Right. If we had a way to measure a person's human capital and we could see it being filled up or their potential, human potential, 
because that's what you care about. You don't care how much I'm worth, who my parents are. You want to know right. how talented I am. How do there, you hire a, people? How do you run people? So, people Mike, I, if, if I can comment a little bit and in, in take off on this a bit. Beyond what I call the, the identification of the individual and helping them reach their full potential, there is a dynamic of the, the community and the network. It, it is great to identify, find that person, but that person will influence every kid around them in that school as they matriculate through at least K through 12. I look at, again, the, the, the schools that I went through, and you know, like all things, you get a standard distribution of you know, capacity, ability, and you know, intelligence, and all those sort of things. But when you have a, a group of students that is a very diverse group, socioeconomic, religious, you know, uh, backgrounds in the same classroom, you know, we, we, as you know, do these aptitude tests, and you kind of find out that no matter what community you go to, you kind of get the same distribution in those communities. But when you put them in, what happens is, is you'll see people at the top that are very different looking than everyone, which, you know, when I say different looking, being diverse in that context, that brings the whole group along. And I go back to the story of being bused across town on bus 13. Were we any different than any other kids growing up in Denver at that time? Why were we so in aggregate successful in our lives? A lot had to do with a, our parents, and that we were together. And when we went, I was the only one who looked like me or one of two in all of my classrooms from K through six. But when I look at the dynamic and effect that me being in that classroom had on the rest of the classroom in a positive way, being, you know, top student or this is a smart kid, let's, let's make sure he gets the chance to answer the question or highlight it during, you know, you know winning the awards for, you know, whatever social studies or math or science or whatever it is. That changed the whole dynamic of the, of the classroom and the school. So it, beyond the finding those individual bright stars, I think it's important to make sure we put them in the context of what is the fabric of America. And the fabric of America, frankly, should be a celebrated, diverse fabric. And I think we've got to get back to that and unwind again some of this notion of, no, we can't you know, educate people who, you know, together because that's what America's about. So I've studied, I mean, I'm just going to put a couple factoids out and you can address them. Yeah, I'd like one, to be able to one, answer your question too. Hey, one, we had a presentation earlier today by Linda Resnick, students, et cetera, at the wonderful company. They're the largest employer in the Central Valley. Now, they have taken over a group of schools. They've created an ag tech school. They provide healthy food, after-school activities, and pay for every single kid to go to college, 100% mm -hmm. of in a community. So to me, that's showing you capitalism working, a very successful business who's decided the community is their responsibility, not just their workers. Great. And you, you, you're going to have 80 to 90% of kids primarily of Latin American ancestry whose parents didn't go to school, not only successful in school, but going to college. So I just want to say there are anecdotal examples of this occurring. And, and I think, Ray, I, I just want to make this point. Because we don't measure human capital, Gary Becker, who won a Nobel Prize for this idea, Kevin Murphy and others, you know, we're, we're talking about hundreds of trillions of dollars of what human capital is. How diverse is your employees of your companies today, Robert? If, if I look at it, you know, we've got, you know, gender and racial and ethnic and, and religious diversity, pro more than any other private equity firm that's out there, point number one, and more than any, almost any other tech firm. And, and I say it, it's because it's, not by design. We look for the people who will fit well into our system and do extremely well, and that's what we find because we throw a very wide net out and we try to then find those who will fit within our organization. So I just, Ray, I'm turning it over to you. Only 25% of the young kids in California are of European ancestry. So when we start talking about diversity, etc., 50% of the children under 20 in California are of Latin American ancestry. And the largest percentage of children of Asian ancestry are here in California. 
So at some point, Ray, we're going to have the majority of Americans of either Asian or Latin American ancestry. How does this play and answer, Robert? But I'd be interested to see how you see it playing out. <clears throat> I'd like to answer your first question and connect it to the second question. The second question, the first, que <clears throat> first issue in terms of the education. Um, I've, I've actually spent a lot of time looking at across countries and I've, and, and then also I've been very educated by people who are very, very close to this. And I think it's me a mechanistic question of um, that there's a cycle. So it's not good enough to have education. That there is an issue having to do with a combination of the poverty and the raising. And as you say, at five years old, you can get a statistical reliability in terms of what that might mean in the future. The number of words that have a child has learned and such. The vocabulary it has been spoken to. But that goes on, and it has to be jobs. Okay, if it's not converted to productivity, it's going to be also a problem. There's a self-esteem problem. There's a uselessness problem. We have um, the, um, the bottom 60% of the population is the only population in the world that has rising death rates having to do with opiates and suicides. Shocking. So the usefulness and the converting that to jobs and productivity, that's going to require analysis as the jobs change with technology and so on. But how that can be produced. So there's a cycle that has to be converted into productivity and then a whole cycle that has to be worked out. Now, regarding your question of the changing complexion of the population, look, I think the United States, great competitive advantage is that it, um, bring, it, it is the land of opportunity that has brought up people. It's the only place in the world that you can come from anywhere and you could be a citizen mm -hmm. and really a welcome citizen there so you can feel equal. You can go to almost any other country and that you won't feel that way. And that with that equal opportunity and property rights and so on, you can create the greatest talent uh, gathering location uh, uh, and uh, have those appreciation of differences and with that the opportunity to come up with the best. There's no place in the world that you can have the intellectual property, the element of the rule of law, and that element of diversity of population, right. uh, uh, and that's a great competitive advantage. Um, so I like the diversity of population, and I like that kind of operating, not just because I like it, but because it's practical. I really think that people maybe of our age know what equal opportunity is. Are we is putting what, Robert yeah, in No, our I age. said our yeah. age. Okay, fine. But I, I think, I, think <laughs> I don't want that. this upstart I, I think, in our group right but now. I, 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 I think he's got it too. A lot of people um, don't know actually what that's like because they don't know when we're talking about Kennedy. You right. talked about Kennedy. I talked about Kennedy. Or that time where we are going to um, eliminate poverty, but they uh, go to the moon. Right. That aspirational, and how are we going to do it? And the little clip that you showed of the, all those different types of people. You showed the Indian, you showed the farmer, the rancher, you showed all of those different types of people. Mm -hmm. That's the fabric. Right. So when, we, when you're talking about those different types of people, it's all of that in that fabric. You can't show that in another country and have that as welcoming. So yes, I think that that combined fabric with equal opportunity and rule of law mm -hmm. is the magic of the United States, and I think we're losing that. Right. Okay, well, we're going to... I'm going to give you the closing statement. Yeah, here, thanks. Right? Thanks, Frank. The thing we didn't discuss is connectivity. We now have a connected economy. We all are getting information immediately as it's produced, and I'm not saying news, but immediately as it's produced. So as we think about the changes, the re-architecture of the mechanisms, we have to ensure that we use that dynamic of connectivity to raise awareness and talk about what are the policies that need to be changed and who are the constituents we need to get to to help those policies move forward. I'm greatly optimistic 
about what we can do. Because I've had an opportunity like you to travel the world. This is the greatest country on the planet, no question. Mm. Okay, you may disagree, I agree. Okay. I, I think it's a great country, but I think we have risks. I, we have risks, but I still think it's the greatest country on the planet that we can fix. We have to decide to fix it. And it takes leadership to say, we're going to go make these changes. It takes our politicians to actually get their act together, or we got to get them out of the way. And business people, we have to get our act together and work together to ensure that we create that opportunity for all of our citizenry. Yeah, That's but, the key. Uh, but I'm a pragmatist, and I'm saying, who is the we, and how are we so the behaving we, with each other? Right. So Ray, how, who is the we, and how I will are tell you we behaving? I, we got to behave differently. I take with my each personal other. responsibility to be part of that we. I know Mike does as well. I, I, know, I know, but that ain't good here. enough. Right. I know, but my job is to educate more and to get I more know to we become part of the best, we. But it has to be nationally. The we has got to be the people of the level of power, and we have to want to know that we're going to do it together and do it. Ray, I, I just want you to know, um, Margaret Mead pointed out, it's always a small group of people that change the world. Right. And in closing, I want to make just a couple points. One, in 1965, I wrote down this formula. So it's... 54 years ago, and when I think about the formula, and I just listened to the two of you talk, the basic formula was we had financial technology, call it the marketplace, mm -hmm. that served as a multiplier effect on the world's largest asset, human capital and human potential, the world's second largest asset, social capital. And you spoke about social capital continually today, Ray, rule of law, property rights, and other things that are provided. And that is one of the reasons why, in a recent poll, 61% of everyone who had wealth in China wants to leave and move, 41% to the United States, 20% to Europe. And so, in closing, Ray, I want to point out, when I just listened to your last little talk, and, and Roberts, both of you sounded like Ronald Reagan. Okay, this is an amazing country. We're maybe the only country in the history of the world that's been willing to change its face mm -hmm. peacefully. Right. Okay, you're challenging us today, Ray, but let's go back and take an excerpt in closing here from Ronald Reagan's last speech in the White House in 1989, 30 years ago today. And when I think about it, my very first speech 50 years ago, almost today, was the best investor as a social scientist. And in many ways, Ray, you are a social scientist, and in many ways, Robert, you're a social scientist. So let's look at what the President of the United States said in 1989. A man wrote me and said, you can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German, a Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the, of the earth can come to live in America and become an American. We lead the world because unique among nations, we draw our people, our strength, from every country and every corner of the world. And by doing so, we continuously renew and enrich our nation. This quality is vital to our future as a nation. If we ever closed the door to new Americans, our leadership in the world would soon be lost. A number of years ago, an American student traveling in Europe took an East German ship across the Baltic Sea. One of the ship's crew members from East Germany, a man in his 60s, struck up a conversation with the American student. After a while, the student asked the man how he had learned such good English. And the man explained that he had once lived in America. He said that for over a year, he'd worked as a farmer in Oklahoma and California, that he'd planted tomatoes and picked ripe melons. It was, the man said, the happiest time of his life. Well, the student, who'd seen the awful conditions behind the Iron Curtain, blurted out the question, well, why did you ever leave? I had to, he said. The war ended. 
the man had been in, in America as a German prisoner of war. It is bold men and women yearning for freedom and opportunity who leave their homelands and come to a new country to start their lives over. They believe in the American dream, and over and over they make it come true for themselves, for their children, and for others. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Robert. Thank you so much. Thank you. I accept the challenge. Thank and thank you all again. And we'll see you next year and at Poolside Now. Thank you.